Welcome to another in our series on immigration. This series is being brought to you by the American Democracy Project here at IPFW, the Department of History, and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. Tonight's topic is education. We have with us as guest from uh, Northwest Allen Schools, Nancy Leininger, from East Allen Schools, Jeannie Zare, and from Fort Wayne Community Schools, Doug Coates. Thank you all very much for joining us. And if you don't mind, why don't you tell us what your titles are, what your jobs are uh, in each of those school corporations. Let's start with Nancy. I am uh, the ESL support um, services coordinator of those services and uh, the, also a curriculum coordinator. So I wear a couple different hats, but primarily I work with our uh, services for the ESL population. Okay, and very good. And Jean? I'm Title I Area Administrator, and most of the ESL students in our district are in our Title I schools. Okay, done. And I'm the Chief Operations Officer for the district. And uh, the uh, ESL program is uh, one of the programs that's uh, charged to my office along with student services, and they both have interaction with uh, ESL youngsters and families. Okay, good. Now, people, of course, hear about all three of these school corporations all the time, but I'm not sure people understand exactly how big they are. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's start with the largest one. Doug, approximately how many students are we talking in Fort Wayne? We have about 31,500 um, this year, maybe 31,400. Um, 53 schools. Very good. And mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in East Allen? Yes, 10,000 students, 18 buildings. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in uh, Northwest? Uh, we have over 6,000 students. 6,000 students. We're, we're talking about a large number of students, no matter mm -hmm. how you look at this. Mm -hmm. And none of you are subject to the Kern and Shepherd consolidation rules and those sorts of things no. in terms of 2,000 and smaller. But we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about big school corporations. Mm -hmm. How diverse are those populations? Are we talking about predominantly white population? Is there a predominantly, is there a large minority sector? that we have in any one of the schools, Northwest? We have uh, about 9%, 9-10% minority. Mm -hmm. So something that's relatively close to Allen County, a little less than Allen County, yes. but close mm -hmm. to Allen County's mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. A little larger than that, maybe around 20% minority. Okay, and in Fort Wayne? 25% uh, African American and another 5 to 10%, I think, would be uh, other minorities that represent there. We. Um, we have youngsters who speak um, 83 languages or dialects, so we're, we're quite diverse. Yeah, and that, that's a stat mm -hmm. that oftentimes blows people away, mm -hmm. the number yes. of languages and dialects mm -hmm. spoken in, in Fort Community Schools. Uh, in terms of uh, English as a second language, you all have some responsibility for English as a second language. How big are those programs in each of the school corporations? Uh, let's start again with Nancy. Well, as far as size, we have over 200 students that qualify for services this year. It's grown steadily over the last five years. Um, we have approximately 36 different languages, and um, we have, oh, I think in the neighborhood of about 30 different countries that are represented among those children. And in terms of those different languages, are, are we talking primarily from Central South America, from Eastern or Western Europe? Is there, is there a pattern that it falls into? It, it's kind of interesting because uh, generally uh, there's an assumption made that um, It'll be a Hispanic, a Spanish population. However, in our corporation, we have more Asian children. And then we have uh, our European children, which would be Eastern and Western, both uh, mm -hmm. represented. And then, uh, then Spanish, Hispanics. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about in East Allen? Mm -hmm. uh, we have more than doubled since October, September, October 2007. And we're approaching about 1,000 children um, in our ESL programs. And our largest number of children are Burmese and then Hispanic, and just a few of other, some of the other um, countries, some Laotian, Bosnian, but the majority right now are, are Burmese children. Mm -hmm. And Fort Wayne, obviously, you've already told us 80-some 80, 80 languages. Yeah. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of the diversity of that group? Uh, we have, well, for, uh, for starters, we just went over 2,000 students participating actively in our ESL program this year, so we're just just over 2,000, and then there's another 1,200 or so youngsters who are immigrant students but uh, don't need the ESL services mm -hmm. because they're fluent in English. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and represented among those are Spanish-speaking, Burmese, Vietnamese, Middle East, Laotian, 
uh, Thailand, uh, Eastern Europeans, and some from the Philippines. Those are the biggest groups. There mm -hmm. are many others, but most populous ones were represented by that list. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a slide that yeah, there's a slide there. Home can see that uh, breaks down foreign community schools as, right. as the largest mm -hmm. uh, of the three school corporations we're talking to today. When we've been doing other programs in this series, we've been very careful to uh, pay attention to the specific terms that we're using when discussing issues. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, last week we, we made a lot of reference to foreign-born folks. Uh, when we had folks here from uh, Citizen and Immigration Services, as well as Catholic Charities and an attorney, we talked about the differences between immigrants in general, mm -hmm. legal versus illegal, mm -hmm. refugees, etc. <laughs> what are the terms that we need to know about, or what are the definitions we need to worry about in, in the world of education? Let's mm -hmm. actually start with Jean. Mm -hmm. um, well, now we're hearing more about English language learners, ELL. And uh, so it's like every year we hear some new terms. And we're not too worried about it anymore. We just know we've got a job to do. And so we're getting used to hearing new acronyms and yeah. just flowing with it. And so what's the difference between an ESL and an ELL student? I don't know. Maybe Doug. I, I, she I probably, because she has yeah. more training in the, in the field than I do. Well, ESL now designates a program. Mm -hmm. uh, we have bilingual transitional programs and then we also have ESL pull-out programs and then immersion programs and so ESL is a, a designated program that we we use and as Jean said uh, ELL, ENL, mm -hmm. uh, those are English kind of... English as a new language? English as okay. a new language. Those are terms that are used to describe the students Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, so when we're tonight, what sort of terms should we be using when we... I need to doctor up all my notes so I change my oh. questions. What terms should I be worried about using this evening? Well, I think uh, ESL and ELL are the most commonly used. Mm -hmm. uh, two other acronyms that you might want to consider because you'll see them written in the literature are um, the acronym LEP, Limited English Proficient, mm -hmm. uh, which is a descriptor of what a, a student receiving uh, ESL services would be. And then you also see FEP, Fluent English Proficient. So those are the ones that I think that are probably mm -hmm. most commonly used um, in public schools. So what are the issues that, uh, whether, whether this is uh, an ELL or ESL or, or a, a brand new student here, what sort of issues are, are these foreign-born or ESL students uh, facing when they, when they show up in, in the school system? And I guess uh, a secondary question is, does it matter whether they're coming in as elementary, middle, or high school students? Um, Nancy? I, it does matter, and it matters what they're bringing with them as far as background. If we have a student that has never had any formal education or experience with education, uh, for instance, many of the Burmese students mm -hmm. that are coming to us now are have no experience whatsoever with school, and and they come as a what we call level. We have levels of fluency. Level one would be someone who cannot speak any English, nor write or understand when it's spoken, and then it. Pro progresses from there to two, three, four. Even a child that's considered fluent at a level five, uh, many times when they get into the upper grades, when they're into high school, the content, the academic language can trip them up, mm -hmm. even though they've been very, very proficient up until, mm -hmm. until that time. And, and I'm guessing that the, some of the issues are not just about learning a language, but also about the culture as well. Absolutely, yeah. And so Absolutely. What, what do you see out in East Allen, especially with that uh, growing Burmese population? We have clusters of Burmese coming. It's not like a family and one or two children. Um, at the beginning of, the, I think it was the first Monday in October, our, our ESL director and two of the Burmese uh, uh, interpreters went out to one of the apartment complexes where they're being settled and went looking for students, literally just door to door, and found 28 students. Who weren't in school. Who were not in school. And so then we go back and figure out where can they go, what ages are they, and start the enrolling process. And she went out the next day and found about 20 more. And so we're bringing in groups of students and opening up classrooms. Like right now, we're opening up three more classrooms in the district this week. So um, 
it, we're just keeping a step ahead, but we're doing a lot better because last year it kind of blindsided us. We didn't know this many uh, refugee families were going to be resettled over the summer, and we open our doors in August, and we're like, wow. So the kids have issues with when, they're, when they um, come to school and you're a middle school student, you can tell that a 12-year-old child is wanting to fit into the culture. We're a little 6- yes. or 7 year olds just mm -hmm. happy to be at school and yes. well accepted and there's no issue. But you can tell the middle school kids this is a bigger deal for them and they more quickly will acquire our American way of dress within days. Within days, Within they will, days. Yeah, yeah, they will change what, what they what they wear. Well, and Doug, I would have to guess, given just the size of Fort Wayne Community Schools geographically and in terms of the number of students, the challenges that the students are facing. While we've, I'm sure we've heard some of them here, are they more diverse given the increased diversity of what you see in Fort Wayne Community Schools? Is there something, uh, or is it just there is more of it? Well, I, I think one of the uh, uh, unique things about uh, Fort Wayne Community Schools uh, ESL program is that when youngsters come to this country uh, from a different culture, they share multiple cultures because we have such a variety of, uh, of uh, cultures represented in the classrooms. So Burmese youngsters would come to us, for example, and uh, intermingle with, uh, with children from Eastern Europe and from uh, the Middle East and other countries. So it really is uh, a chance to, to share and learn about other cultures on the fast track. And um, there's uh, uh, lots of issues that uh, come to play uh, that we don't think about in our everyday lives. For example, a diet and, mm -hmm. and just uh, dietary preferences mm -hmm. are quite different depending on uh, areas of the world where um, youngsters come, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the religion and the interaction of religion with, uh, with government and government entities and so forth. Um, Interaction with uh, with the adults and uh, how to communicate with staff and schools and so forth is quite different uh, from from one part of the world to another. So it's an exciting and fun time to see all that interaction take place. And I would echo uh, what my colleague said about uh, the issue that that um, uh, it's fun to see the youngsters who are just happy to be there and meet friends mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, the the. Uh, culturalization and Americanization of the middle school and high school age students is much more serious uh, in their view than, uh, than, than with the elementary age ch children. So do you really think it's easier given the increased diversity? You said that you'll have Burmese student meeting uh, Eastern European mm -hmm. or Western European. Mm -hmm. Is it easier then when, when they're not just the only quote, different group mm -hmm. there? Is that what you've mm -hmm. found in each of the school corporations? I think so, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So what challenge do you think seems to pose the greatest challenge to, to students who are coming in? What, if there was one thing that you had to single out as the largest challenge? Oh, the, lang the language barrier. Yeah. The language yeah, barrier. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 The cultural would, stuff can be exchanged, oh, but yeah. without the language skills, mm -hmm. then, then uh, you really can't get to explain the cultural mm -hmm. stuff, can you? Yes, yeah, it's the communication yes. piece in general. It's mm -hmm. not only between the children, but uh, communicating with moms and dads uh, who don't speak English and uh, providing that in a continual way so that uh, interpreters and translators are available for parent-teacher conferences and uh, even even a phone call, you know, uh, if uh, parents need to call and talk to uh, someone at the school. Uh, so um, communication is the big challenge. Yeah, they may not know what homework is. Well, and filling out the forms. Many yeah. times when sure. they're enrolling their child, they don't understand what that form involves, and uh, one of one of our uh, goals this year is to do more in the area of translating those forms. However, when you're speaking of 30 some different languages, 80 different languages, mm -hmm. that's almost mm -hmm. an impo impossible yeah. task. We have 22 languages, and we discovered quickly last year that when when people hear that Burmese families, refugee families, are coming, they assume they're all of the same people group, and there's about five people groups coming to Fort Wayne, and there's at least four different languages in our school district of Burmese, and so when you hire a translator, you have to ask which language, and we're trying to go with the one that's, you know, the most majority, and try to find someone who might actually be fluent in two or three of the different dialects, mm -hmm. and that's not always real easy 
to find sure. and, and and written forms you just assume well we'll get it and we have found the fonts on the computers and so we have translators yes. that are creating our forms in this beautiful script the the Burmese scripts are very beautiful very very flowy and not lots of round shapes and and but that doesn't mean that the parents are literate in their language. Many of them have been on the run for 15 to 20 years and from the revolution in Burma and so they've been living in refugee camps for years mm -hmm. and so they don't have schooling and the children are not coming from any schools. They maybe have lived their entire life in the jungle or in a refugee camp and have never been in a school, never held a book. Interestingly, the uh, um, the, the Burmese uh, youngsters who come to us from Chiefly, we received them from um, three different uh, refugee camps in Thailand, right across the, the border from Myanmar. And the youngsters who grew up in those camps speak Thai mm -hmm. because that's the right. language mm -hmm. they learned. Yes. And then the rest of the population can speak Burmese or mm -hmm. Mon or Chin or Karen. whatever. Karen. Karen, yeah. yeah. So, um, so even among the, the areas of the world, we find these different languages that are represented. So is language still probably the biggest challenge then for faculty members as well? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well yes. someone in the audience has asked I think kind of an interesting question. I was actually at a middle school today uh, and I asked the students what they had for lunch and everybody immediately yelled out tacos and they were very happy about that. Apparently <laughs> Tuesdays are not so good at that school but Thursdays are a good day at that school. Yeah. And somebody in the audience has asked if the influx of diversity has changed the lunch program. In other words, are there more choices in middle school and high school than there used to be? Mm -hmm. All right, cafeteria manager, we happen to, to cook meals in the schools at uh, East Allen and so they are trying to accommodate. We do have some of our refugee families so that the children are bringing their lunch with them, uh, particularly if they find, just as we would if we went to a country that had dramatically different cuisine than we were used to, we would struggle with just picking up and eating something we'd never had before. And so the children are like that. They have not seen macaroni and cheese or they don't know what a hot dog is. And so why would I eat something I've never seen before in my life? And so we've had to really adjust how we do that. Now we've not dramatically changed our menu, but we have made certainly accommodations for our Muslim believers who can't have pork. So we make sure that there's alternatives. Right. You know, what's interesting, you, you all talk about this in a very positive light and, and how it's helping to enrich oh, the school. Yes. Oh, uh, we have a couple yes. of editorial cartoons that, that will be shown on the screen. One of them uh, deals with the Irish uh, population. And mm -hmm. today, of course, when we think of Irish folks, everybody thinks, oh, yeah. what a wonderful group of people. St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, exactly. Oh, yes. There are plenty yes. of reasons <laughs> to like the Irish. But when they first started immigrating mm -hmm. to the United States, they were not viewed in that way. And mm -hmm. in this particular mm -hmm. cartoon, uh, mm -hmm. the, the bad child in the classroom is mm -hmm. an Irish uh, person. Mm -hmm. And the other one shows, uh, uh, the, it, it helps to illustrate the fear of Roman Catholicism that was coming along mm -hmm. with a lot of European mm -hmm. immigrants. Yeah. And so it shows this very sort of ominous image of the Pope, a shadow of the Pope mm -hmm. coming across the United States, scaring mm -hmm. people. And today we have a very different view of that, don't we? Yes. Oh yes. And, oh, and, yes. and that's, that, obviously that's, that's for a, a positive change. Now, some people do say that, uh, that one of the purposes of schools is to assimilate people. We've heard someone already use the term acculturation here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some people say it's a good thing, some people say it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, is that one of the tasks of schools today? Is, is the task of school to help assimilate new groups of people into our society? Do you view that as part of the purpose of school mm -hmm. these days? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we do. Uh, we believe that strongly. Uh, and probably the biggest rationale for such a belief is that um, the youngsters who are in school today uh, will be assuming positions uh, in companies and business and industry soon and they will be on uh, work teams and in environments where that same acculturation will have occurred and it's uh, very, very good for them to, to learn about other cultures, other ethnicities, uh, and uh, be able to uh, interact comfortably uh, with uh, uh, with their peers in the work environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that what you're seeing in uh, in East Allen as well? Yeah, absolutely. And for America to continue to succeed as a nation, it's important that we have educated citizens, and we are a country of immigrants. 
and uh, I wouldn't be here. I would just guess looking around this table that none of us would be here if we had not had some immigrant ancestors. I had one that would have been beheaded if he'd stayed in the country where he was at, so I'm really glad he got out and, and made it here so I can be here. And so this is what America does. This is who we are. And uh, the, the challenges come when many come when many refugees come to, to one city at a time, and that's what we've seen is that our resources have been challenged. And so we've had to uh, respond in some new ways. But learning what a democracy is, learning, to, learning a new language, but holding on to who I am and my identity. Most of us are proud of our heritage, and we can name all the ethnicities that come into making who we are as Americans. And I hope that in a couple generations that these children that we have in our schools right now will be able to do the same. Proud to be an American, and here's my heritage. And so in, in Northwest, I'll, I'll start this question okay. with Northwest, but do you, in terms of that task of helping to assimilate or acculturate people to the new environment, do you do that through, I'll use the term mainstreaming, I'm sure that's not the term I should be using, but you try to get the students into the classroom with all the other students, oh, yes. right? Mm -hmm. In fact, um, that's because our population of, of uh, students is, is scattered amongst Ten different schools. I mean, when you have only 200 plus students within a school district the size of ours, um, we do not have any special classrooms other than we have paraprofessionals that are trained to work on language acquisition. And then the students spend most of their time in the regular classroom. Um, and so learning the professionals content. move around from yes. school to school. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Actually, every one of our buildings has a paraprofessional now so that uh, they don't have to move between the buildings. They basically are stationed at a building. And the students, again, we're very fortunate because of our situation has grown steadily and we've been able to keep up and continue to add on to our services. So we have uh, most children are receiving anywhere from 45 minutes to 50 minutes a day with language instruction from a paraprofessional. And then they're pushed, or they're, then they go back into the classroom. And m again, a goal for us this year will be to work with our teachers and teach them more strategies, techniques to shelter the education of the instructional mm -hmm. work that's to do with the kids. Well, we have another question from the folks who are here, and one of them wants to know if the, the inclusion is standard for all students, including those who may be least English proficient, or uh, how do you deal with a student like yeah. that? No. And we may all mm -hmm. be dealing with it differently, mm -hmm. but different when, when we were... Um, challenged last fall with so many coming all at once. By about mid-year, we realized that our students who were coming in at that, I think Doug talked about that level one, that loss, English loss links test that determines the level. Nancy spoke to it too. Yeah. Is um, we realized that we were having for the first time in East Allen, students coming with no English at all none. And so to put them out into regular classrooms would have probably been counterproductive. And so we started two different programs. Continued our ESL program for those children that have some level of English, a level two or three or four. But for those children that are coming in with no English uh, at all yet, we started newcomer programs. And those are, um, yeah, and the community has responded really well with those. Those that are working with the Burmese uh, believe that this is the way to go in that they have some sheltered that's another term I shouldn't use, because so that means something else. Yes. But, but a, no, a, a newcomer program uh -huh. where we just focus on learning English. So I can then go participate in class maybe within six months to by the end of the year. As, the, as soon as they start acquiring English, some do quicker than others, depending on what they're participating in outside of the school day, then they move into the ESL program where they maybe get help for an hour a day, but they're in classes most of the time. So we now have two two levels, newcomers and ESL. We've gone from a newcomer program being in one place to it'll soon be in four schools. We've gone from ESL being in one building to being in nine buildings. And I think Fort Wayne has seen that same kind of change. Mm -hmm. yeah, how does Fort Wayne uh, address this issue of inclusion of even the, the, those with the least English skills and maybe no English skills? Right. The youngsters that come to us and after uh, we do an assessment find that they're level one that's the beginner level, uh, receive more classroom instruction um, separated. 
uh, uh, from uh, their English-speaking peers. And then as they progress, they, uh, they move into um, more and more uh, of the general education classes. And, you know, it's working quite well. I'm going to make reference to a slide. Uh, and this particular slide is the one that's entitled uh, February 7, 2000. February 2007, Lost Links Levels in Fall ISTEP. This data is a year old, but it lists there uh, in the first column on the left-hand side the, the various um, Lost Links levels, one through five, and then you can see there the number of youngsters at each level who passed their ISTEP test um, last year, and if you notice, the higher the level, uh, the more children uh, pass it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so you can see that, uh, actually, if you look at there's a little yellow cell down the right-hand side. Uh, when the youngsters finally get to that level five, we're looking at 83% of the kids passing, which is better than our, our overall number uh, for I-STEP. Similarly, in math, same kind of a number distribution, and 91% of the youngsters, when they reach level five, uh, can do well. So, uh, so the um, more intense uh, uh, ESL uh, intervention early, followed by uh, more and more exposure to gen ed as the kids pick up the language, works quite well. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's it's working for us that way. Well, you you've now raised, of course, one of the subjects we have to talk about, and that's <laughs> testing, whether it's No Child Left Behind or Public Law 221. Do either of those bits of legislation recognize foreign-born or ESL or ELL or LEP students, and, and do they make special provisions for them in terms of the testing that, that goes on? We'll start with Doug. Okay. Um, since, well, since no one was jumping in to answer that one, we'll just start with That's a tough one. It's not, our, that's Two tough. It's not a happy topic. Mm -mm. No. Um, first of all, the, 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 the testing, particularly of the level one, level two youngsters, is disturbing. Um, and and uh, we we would like to work with legislators to see if we couldn't get that uh, get that change some way. And I would anticipate because right now they're included. Yes, in, they're in tested. Yes. Math and science, right. they must yes. take it if they've been they're here tested. one day. And uh, you, you made reference in your second question to whether or not there was they, there was uh, some reference to them in AYP uh, in Public Law 221 and also. No child left behind, and there is. They're they're one of the subgroups that that are measured uh, through this testing, and um, I would refer you to the one slide there that's titled "This is Fort Wayne Community School Data AYP Summary Report 2006," and uh, you can see there's all down the left hand side are all the various subgroups of youngsters who um, who uh, are tested and need to be passing. Uh, uh, the I step, and then uh, notice that they're that they're tested in English and math, and we have to also have to test at least 95 percent of all those subgroups too. So they're tested there. The little green dots means that that particular group for Fort Wayne um, passed the mark, and the red dots mean they did not. And if you notice, uh, limited English proficient down next to the bottom in 2006 uh, were one of the groups that that uh, made it. We had. Uh, substantial number of level four and five youngsters that year so they carried the group mm -hmm. and and they passed yeah. and they didn't quite make it last year if you look at mm -hmm. another slide it's similar to that one that's AYP for 2007 you see the red dot there um, for that particular subgroup but um, it's 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 disturbing that we must test kids uh, we hear reports all the time about uh, how upsetting it is uh, for uh, some of the um, ESL children, particularly the ones and twos, mm -hmm. uh, because these youngsters have a driving desire to succeed. Mm -hmm. They're very industrious, and they want uh, badly to learn the language. And, uh, and coming from a different culture where there's some question about how the test will be used and what its purpose is, and they frequently, when they're newcomers, don't understand all that, it's, um, it's a bad deal for the kids to uh, have to uh, subject themselves to that testing. But it's something that we're hoping that we can, we can fix as mm -hmm. legislative sessions come and go. Well, Jane, uh, sorry to interrupt, but um, do the students even understand? You say if they're there for the first day and it happens to be I-STEP day, they're yeah. going to take a test. Yeah. How, how do you even explain well, to them what's happening? You can't. One of the teachers told me that, that uh, she went in and helped um, with a group of newcomers take I-STEP, the science and the math part, and that uh, they knew the numbers. And she would say number two, and she could read it to them. And they, would, they knew they were supposed to fill in a bubble, and then they would look up at her and say two. 
and so she'd go on to number two, and then they'd say three, and they, they knew the sequence of the numbers and that they were to fill in a bubble. That was it. And so she was so dis- discouraged by that experience to see, you know, though they weren't upset by it. They just thought, I'm just mm-hmm. supposed to fill in a bubble, yes. but it, the absurdity of it is what struck her as kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. And AYP, it's a term that's been used, Nancy, why don't you uh, tell um, us all what it means? It's basically uh, whether or not a corporation is making adequately year, adequate yearly progress. Mm-hmm. It's, it's number crunching on the mm-hmm. state level to make sure that um, uh, it's kind of an accountability piece, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we're, the children are performing as we would expect them and making the progress that mm-hmm. they need to be making. They also do a, um, I'm trying to think of what the acronym is, but there is an AMOS that basically they're looking at the subgroup of ESL, ELL students and how well they're performing within the school district and are they making enough progress. Mm -hmm. And that's based on uh, the language acquisition achievement test that we give them in the spring. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jean. Research says that conversationally we can learn a new language and function pretty well in about three to five years. But to think cognitively with academic language is like five to seven years. And here we are asking Mm -hmm. them to think cognitively on on day day one. And that lengthens with the children when they come to us if they have had no experience whatsoever learning in in education with a school, school. then that adds that much more time Mm -hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about the, this, uh, this adequate yearly progress that has mm-hmm. to happen. Uh, when, when we're talking about that progress, is it this year's third graders compared to last year's third graders, or is it a cohort thing where you literally will follow third graders to fourth, to fifth, to sixth, et cetera? Jean? Wish it was that. You the wish latter, it was the yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's it is not. just the subgroups and across <clears throat> the entire yeah. district. And not that there aren't some good things about No Child Left Behind. We are now looking at these mm-hmm. subgroups with new eyes and realizing that every child does count. And I like that piece of it, but we also have to be reasonable. And the ESL population is one where we're not too reasonable yet. Mm-hmm. I think Washington's starting to get the message because there have been some. Some, some voices that have been, I think, getting the message through. And so really for East Allen, with the influx you've had oh in the last year, the, yeah. the, the difference between last year and this year... Could be pretty so dramatic. It yeah. could be very dramatic. Yes. Yeah. In mm-hmm. fact, I'm guessing you're probably expecting it to be dramatic. Yes. Yeah. And so because of that one thing, some of the schools will be uh, will be labeled as not achieving their Correct. AYP. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is not good for the school corporation mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, do do the tests also recognize differences between, say, uh, uh, students who are learning disabled as well as uh, m- mainstream students? Uh, I noticed on the graphics that Fort Wayne Community School has provided for us, we saw uh, there was a category for ESL students or limited English mm-hmm. students. Mm-hmm. Are there categories as well for learning disabled students? Mm-hmm. Are they handled the same or differently when it comes to the testing? There's a category for special education education students and um, then another thing that we should probably mention here are the accommodations that can be yes. made for students with uh, some kind of a learning disability yes. and there's a wide variety of them but for example um, uh, if, a, um, if a student is reading disabled they can still take the math portion uh, by having uh, a portion of the test read to them. Mm-hmm. So uh, there are some uh, extra time is another one that's mm-hmm. commonly invoked. So there are several accommodations that can be made for students with specific kinds of disabilities. And uh, how do you deal with, uh, say, a, a, an English as a second language student or someone without English skills who may also be learning disabled? Obviously, it's going to complicate mm. the problem. Yeah, we've had that yeah. the, and we, ha- we have to be very careful with that. Mm-hmm. Um, We're hesitant to, very hesitant to do that second label. In, in fact, mm-hmm. they, um, we, wait. we wait at so least worried. three years, mm-hmm. at least three years until we begin, chance, yeah. yes, we begin to go through the process of determining whether or not they do indeed have a learning disability. Um, and that's that comes from the history of of our um, ESL EL children because in the past in our programming many of those children were placed in special education before it was determined that it was mm-hmm. definitely just a language barrier it wasn't indeed a 
uh, learning disability. Right, so the students were put in a learning environment that really was not right yes. for them. Right. And yes. so now you make sure that you get to that point where mm -hmm. some cognitive mm -hmm. ability is taking place mm -hmm. in the child and you can really determine whether or not they're learning disabled mm -hmm. before you do something. Mm -hmm. As far as individual schools are concerned, I want to go back to AYP again. We hear, we hear about schools being labeled as failing, quote failing. Mm -hmm. Is a school failing if there is one of the many categories in which you did not meet your AYP? A school fails to make AYP if they don't get a little green dot in mm -hmm. each yeah, one of those 37 cells in the in the uh, slide that we referenced mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't recognize how many categories we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it is a very broad uh, number of categories, mm -hmm. and any one of them going the wrong color. Mm -hmm means that the school mm -hmm. has not made the annual right. progress they're supposed to make, which, which uh, I think scares off quite a few folks. Have you found that, uh, as someone here in the audience wants to know, do students from certain political or environmental backgrounds show maybe a higher interest in a particular area of study? Uh, or is it uh, they, they're like uh, all students? They're, they're interested and once something really excites them, that's what they're going to get into. Hmm. I'd say we see everything. Yeah. I, we have noticed with some of our um, Burmese children, because they didn't have school, that they happen to love art, drawing and uh, origami, uh, music, because they had time to, do, to pursue that and they had very little else to pursue in the camps. Um, we have one young man who, whose family came several years ago uh, from Burma, whose dad was a surgeon in, uh, in the country of Burma, now Myanmar, and he is just applying himself. He is going to be a doctor, he's determined, and he's now in about, he would be about, I believe, a freshman by now, and I knew him as a, a fifth grader when he came to, to the school where I was at, and uh, he, the mother says he works, stays up late at night studying on his own with no, no work with her at all because he is so determined to succeed because I think he he grasps the opportunity that's here and sometimes we who have been here our whole lives have forgotten yeah. yes yes yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not certain um, on how to answer the question about a, yeah. a vocational interest but yes. I can tell you that um, because ESL students come from a background where they were generally deprived of reading materials they love to read as they as they master mm -hmm. That ability, they are enthralled with our libraries and the and the materials that are in the buildings uh, uh, for reading for you know causal, casual reading or, or, or for their studies. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I've noticed, and I would ditto uh, the art and uh, um, and the music. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it too. Yeah, they're very excited. Typically. Mm -hmm. And can part of that, that be that uh, the language issue is not there when you're talking about art and music? Yes, yeah. yes. In but fact, we encourage the teachers to use those avenues mm -hmm. um, initially with students that are in the lower levels of, of uh, language uh, mm -hmm. fluency. Well, we're talking about a fairly diverse population in each of the school corporations yes. in terms of the, the ESL or, or uh, foreign-born students. Uh, and in some instances, we know exactly the reason why folks are here. Are there some some categories or some reasons, more reasons that people are here than others? Uh, you know, unrest, uh, whether it's something that happened in the Balkans, whether it's Burma. Uh, what is bringing people to northeastern Indiana, in other words? Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy, oh, what's well, bringing them out to northwest Allen County Well, to northwest Allen, we, we have a variety, but one of our largest groups uh, comes from adoptions. Um, we have several church families that have been encouraging their members to adopt children, especially the children that we have from uh, Russia and uh, Bosnia. Those are two uh, major areas. Also, there are Chinese children. So there's a lot of children being adopted and then uh, become part of a Northwest family. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. and how about in East Allen? Um, at first, we had a lot of Hispanic families, but they were moving often from other parts of the United States. And our Burmese families are coming through the Refugee Resettlement Act. And so we are a resettlement city. And a lot of people don't understand all of that. But Catholic Charities is not choosing to go find refugee families to bring here. Catholic Charities is a gracious host that is funneling 
handling the funding and simply doing the social work that needs to be done. So they're an agency that's been commissioned to receive and settle the families, and we are Resettlement City uh, in North America. There are several, yes. several of us. Yeah, Indianapolis, I know, is yeah. another one. And, and yeah. what's interesting about that, we've talked about this in other, in other mm -hmm. programs, Good. that's actually an international issue. Correct. And we're yeah. talking about the local uh, application or struggles in dealing with an international issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The federal government right. has made a decision, mm -hmm. yeah. state government has made a decision, and now you as school, uh, local school corporations are, are trying to yes. deal with that as well. Yeah. Uh, in another show we had folks from Family and Social Services Administration Good. here as well as oh. Wayne Township and Can I mm -hmm. uh, talking a little bit about the partnerships that have had to be created mm -hmm. to deal exactly with mm -hmm. this resettlement issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, anything different as far as Fort Wayne Community Schools are concerned? Uh, two things. First of all, just to piggyback on your comment, you know, we, and I think I could speak for all the school districts represented here, we couldn't uh, do this without the partnerships that we developed mm -hmm. with some of the groups that you've mentioned and others. Mm -hmm. They're very, very helpful, and, uh, you know, this, this, is a, um, this is a community project um, to, to help families who come to us, particularly the refugees and asylee status. Uh, folks who come to us uh, from the worst possible conditions, uh, and um, to get them settled and um, and and uh, uh, acculturated into uh, Fort Wayne or, or wherever is it's not something that just schools can do. And we receive great support from um, the from the agencies uh, in Fort Wayne that do that. Secondly, we've noticed um, just as as an additional comment about the. Um, where they come from and why. Um, we've noticed in Fort Wayne um, that a number of them now are, a uh, number of uh, immigrants are coming as secondary migrants. Um, the yes. initial family yes. member came yes. here years ago mm -hmm. and uh, got a job and yeah. got settled and then called for other members of the family and so they arrived. Um, and it's interesting, the housing pattern, uh, what's interesting about it in Fort Wayne is that there isn't one. Um, I would refer you to the map uh, that's uh, on the slides that we brought with us. And that's a map of Fort Wayne Community Schools and the various colored areas represent the attendance areas of our elementary schools. And then each little dot there that's on that map is uh, representative of an address where there is at least one student who attends ESL classes. So as you can see, um, they are sort of concentrated in the central part of the city, but uh, in general, they're scattered all over. You find them in every quadrant there. And um, so they're, they're settling in a variety of places, and uh, we're providing services as fast as we can in uh, those in the designated ESL schools, and then also we're training teachers and gen ed uh, to receive youngsters mm -hmm. who uh, qualify for services but choose to go to their neighborhood school rather than to uh, a designated ESL site. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a big project for us as well, and you can see that we have to do that because uh, yeah, moms yeah. and dads are living all over town. I was going to say, you can't <laughs> focus on one or two schools. You, yeah. you have to focus mm -hmm. on the entire district. And right. You've brought up, you've, actually, in these last two uh, answers, we've heard very interesting uh, comments, and that is that immigrants don't just come here directly from another country. They oftentimes have settled someplace else and then move here mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also others, after they have settled here, they do tell family and friends mm -hmm. that this is a good place and, and they want to live as a family unit, So as, mm -hmm. as many of us do. Those of us who get along with our families want to live with, as a family mm -hmm. unit. And so they're doing very much the same things that, w that we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, wanna, I hate to do it, but I want to go back to test scores again for a moment. Okay. Yeah, I know that we like to talk about the test scores, but I want to go back to test scores for a moment. Um, are we seeing, or, or do Northwest and East Allen see the same sort of trend that Fort Wayne Community Schools sees? In other words, as you move from level one, two, three, what, however many levels you're using, do you see an increase in the percentage of students who are passing? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. once you get up to that top level, do you also find that they are passing at a higher rate than, yes. than uh, the rest of the student body is? Mm -hmm. Actually, ours um, are keeping pace. They're keeping pace. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're basically at the same same level. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, uh, I can't think of any subgroup that isn't mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. But then we have a, a little bit different uh, 
situation mm -hmm. with our numbers and mm -hmm. the community itself. Sure. Now, what do you do to, other than making sure they can master the language as, as uh, best as possible, uh, are there other things that you're doing that focus on the test? Uh, I hate to say, are you teaching to the test, but I guess that's sort of what I'm asking. Uh, how are you, what else are you doing to help prepare them to take the standardized test as well as become productive members of our community? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the test is aligned to the Indiana standards. Mm -hmm. And we teach to the Indiana standards. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we're supposed to do. So uh, we want to get youngsters ready uh, to, uh, to do well on that one measure, the ISTEP measure, but there are many, many, many other measures of academic success out there. Uh, that are uh, equally and sometimes more important. Uh, so, so um, our preparation is 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 more global than just uh, than just the the one single test. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the 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 test is what's published on page one of the newspaper, the results rather, and uh, and it's what it's the it's the measuring stick that uh, the public has uh, understands. And so looks to uh, see results. So, um, so it's an important part of the school year. But uh, I would I would be remiss if I didn't remind viewers that uh, there are many many other measures that we um, that we help uh, prepare youngsters for. Mm -hmm. We have a very interesting question from one of the people here today. Uh, the person would like to know if it's prudent uh, to recommend EL, EL, uh, sorry, ESL teaching certificates for area students who are looking into teaching degrees. It would seem that that's Absolutely. maybe yes. a good idea. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Nancy and I were joking before <laughs> that we stole her only ESL licensed teacher, yes. and she became our first ESL licensed yes. teacher, and uh, she's doing a wonderful job, but <laughs> so yes. there aren't enough out there. Our other ESL teachers are all certified teachers normally in the language arts area, and so they have a good command of the English language and do a great job because we have a good director who's training them on the spot. Uh, but we could sure use some teachers with certificate and training in that. I, how, how do you do with ESL it's training a, It's teachers. a struggle for us as well, and okay. we train a lot of them in-house. You know, they come to us as yeah. a gen ed teacher yep. and yep. encourage them to go back. Yeah. and Get the uh, license. Yeah, get yeah, the license. We're doing too. So uh, we do that. Uh, and, and, you know, I might add also to that um, uh, this the question seemed as though it was asked by a person who's thinking about teaching mm -hmm. uh, the foreign language license is important as well uh, to be able to teach uh, a foreign language um, mm -hmm. or be fluent in it uh, mm -hmm. is important for us too so we'd like to see um, our teacher candidates that that are bilingual so, so the folks who are looking for a job mm -hmm. yes. who are oh, yes. finishing you up their degree. You will move up to the mm -hmm. top of the list. All right. That, that's <laughs> yes. always a good tip. We, uh -huh. we always like our, our graduates to find mm -hmm. work, so mm -hmm. that's a good tip for them. Uh, I do have, uh, I want to ask another question that uh, um, some people might see as sort of a negative question, but it comes from the audience. And uh, is the non-immigrant community, how is the non-immigrant community reacting to this? In other words, are some resentful that mm -hmm. resources are being siphoned away, as they might say, mm -hmm. from something to deal with these immigrants? Mm -hmm. Are you encountering that, or has it been generally supportive? Uh, how about Northwest? In Island? Northwest, um, they have been very supportive. Um, however, we do not receive significant funding for our program. Um, a lot of it is based, <coughs> excuse me, um, from our own resources within the, the school district. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they've been very supportive and uh, very helpful in many ways. Uh, we have huge PTOs that, that have been offering to do all sorts of wonderful things to help uh, purchase supplies and materials, and so it's... It's been good that way. And I would imagine in some respects in Northwest Allen, since a, a decent percentage of the students are there because of adoption, of course, the parent-teacher yes. organizations are going to say, well, you know, this is my kid we're talking about. Of course, yes. we need to do something to help mm -hmm. out my yes. child. Not that they wouldn't want to help other children, but they have a mm -hmm. personal invested interest in that then. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'd very much like, and, and we've attempted in the past, and again, it is, it is a... Uh, purely communication difficulty, but I'd like to get more like a PTO going of our um, parents of the, the yellow students so that they can have a voice and become more involved. And, mm -hmm. and I think as they are more visible, then that will make it that much more solid 
a foundation or our community will be just that much more connected. And also a way mm -hmm. for you to help make sure they understand what's expected of their children in the school. Yes, be very exactly. Handy, yeah. mm -hmm. How about Nice Dale and Jean? We have had some pushback, mm -hmm. and because of the large numbers of refugees um, that have come, families that have come, so we've had to be creative. And uh, one thing that we set up was a what we call a neighborhood action center, and it's in one of the apartment complexes that has probably about six, seven hundred people living there, which is larger than the town I grew up in, in Ohio, <laughs> and in one apartment complex. And about, we're approaching now about 500 of them being Burmese. And so our social worker that's on site there has created a council and started with bringing together the four groups that are from the four different people groups from Burma who in Burma did not uh, collaborate. Sure. They live separately and, and we're not always friendly. And so they're coming to the table together. They've met about three times now and it has been extremely productive. It may actually be the first, it may be a global first time ever thing that has happened in this this little center that, that we've got going. So very excited about that. And they're getting ready to now add um, representatives from all other ethnic groups that are non-immigrant to come to the table. And so we, we're really excited about having this multicultural council where everybody lives. It's not about we're coming across town and we'll just talk and go back home. No, we all live here. And we need to find a way to get our children to all play and enjoy one another. And we as adults to learn to understand one another's culture and get along. So it's, it's a work in progress and we're all excited about it. I would imagine in Fort Wayne Community Schools, since it is so diverse, it's not like you can yeah, right. you can't follow you can't that same. Yeah. Pinpo you can't do that. You can't put uh, in one apartment mm -hmm. complex. Not uh, with that map. Uh, how, <laughs> how is Fort Wayne Community Schools dealing with it? Has it been? Have you been? Have they been well received? Uh, yes, they have been well received, and uh, we have case managers in each of our elementary schools that function very similar to the way the folks in East mm -hmm. Allen do. Um, the, while there are there are um, apartment complexes that have been designated as housing sites for some of the refugee groups, in particular the, uh, the Burmese. Um, our situation is that over the years we've seen this gradual increase in uh, uh, ESL uh, enrollment. And I would refer you to the slide that's called the uh, ESL enrollment increase. And you can see there uh, that we were under 500 until around 1999 or so district-wide, and then it has increased since then a couple hundred a year. Um, so that circumstance is a little bit different than, than our friends to the east because they saw a rapid increase uh, quite suddenly while ours has been more gradual. And um, so I'll, I'll tell you that um, uh, parents of ESL children are very, very interested in uh, coming to school and interacting. Uh, they're great PTA members and uh, um, um, have um, this intense desire to uh, uh, meet with the teacher and, and discuss progress of their youngster and so forth. And, and uh, so that's been, um, that's been kind of a favorable uh, thing for us. And we don't hear of a lot of pushback, but I think it's because our population increase has been more gradual. It's Not been so easier for people to mm -hmm. get accustomed Correct. to it, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have just a, a couple of minutes left here, and so I, I want to ask you, uh, where do you think we're going to be in, oh, let's say, five years? Uh, is this going to be a wonderful thing in five years? You're, of course, all going to say yes to that. But what do you think <laughs> it's going to look like five years from now? I'll start with Doug. Five years down the road? Um, I see the uh, uh, ESL population uh, leveling off. Um, I see um, as they complete education, um, I'm talking about post-secondary, uh, that uh, they will be quite skilled, industrious workers, uh, and I see them to be a positive uh, contribution to the community at large. Um, I see small business and, uh, and industry being started uh, by folks who uh, are entrepreneurial and, uh, and um, uh, immigrant-based, uh, foreign-born. Um, and I see less and less dependency on um, the kinds of uh, uh, assistance that, mm -hmm. that, that we're providing now because they, the, the, the immigrant population will become more and more independent. Well, there's not a whole lot left, but what do you th where do you think we're going to be five years from now, Jean? I think instead of a melting pot, we're going to be a beautiful mosaic. 
and uh, I don't think there's a thing wrong with that. As I said before, that's what's made America great, and um, I think our our Burmese families and our other immigrant families will do what we've all done. We maybe find a relative in Michigan or Portland, Oregon, and we move across the country and, and come and go. We're a very mobile society, and I think our, our families that are in Fort Wayne will do the same thing. And the ones that choose to stay here, I think we'll be glad they did, and we will, we will be too. Nancy, any final comments? Oh, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I agree with both of them. I also know that a uh, recent audit uh, suggested that Northwest will be um, much more diverse in the coming three to five years. In fact, within the next 18 months, we believe that we will have a, a refugee settlement entering into our midst, and we're excited about it. We, we find it to be wonderful because we were so rural to begin with, and now, you know, we are a much more diverse and interesting population. So sure. that's great. Well, I want to thank you all for, for uh, joining us here today. Uh, we have Nancy Leininger from Northwest Allen County Schools, Jean Zare from East Allen, Cons East Allen County Schools, Doug Coates from Fort Wayne Community Schools. Thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. This has been another in our series on immigration. Mm -hmm. We hope that you've enjoyed this program and that you've uh, watched some of the others. Uh, I want to make sure that you know that these were brought to you by the American Democracy Project here at IPFW, as well as the Department of History and the Mike Down Center for Indiana Politics. Thank you very much for watching.